All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Michael. Uh, thank you to my committee for being here today. And I'm going to be talking about antisocial computing. So social media has brought us closer together, provides social support, and can improve our mood. It has been used for social good. Think about things like the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. It's used to self-organize, such as during the Arab Spring. But however, in recent years, what's becoming clear is that there is a dark side to social media and social computing. Trolling, online harassment, and misinformation are increasingly prevalent in many online platforms today. And even before the recent US presidential elections, maybe already thinking about what's going wrong with social media. Why are there so many trolls in online discussions? Why do I sometimes feel unsafe when posting things online? And why is there so much misinformation? It isn't just a feeling. Antisocial behavior is commonplace. A recent study by Data and Society found that almost half of users have been harassed in one way or another, being called offensive names, physically threatened, or sexually harassed. And you know that antisocial behavior is a problem, where after many popular websites are so overrun uh, by these trolls that they have just decided to completely turn off the ability for anyone to comment. So is social media getting out of hand? And are online communities getting worse over time? And are we actually witnessing an epidemic of bad behavior? So ultimately, we want to build better, healthier online communities to combat any social behavior. And there are several ways to do this. We can create better guidelines for online conduct, design better interventions, as well as develop better systems uh, to combat such behavior. But to do this, first and foremost, we need to understand what's going on today. And so what do we really know about antisocial behavior or about trolling? So prior work has largely characterized trolls as a small vocal minority and that antisocial behavior is due to sociopaths. So in research using primarily qualitative methods, including surveys and interviews, trolls come across largely as this group of people that are very different from uh, most of us. For example, taking immense pleasure in others' misfortune. And other work has also established trolls as having unique psychological profiles, being more Machiavellian or sadistic. But rather than it being innate uh, and the domain of sociopaths, my work shows that antisocial behavior or trolling can be situational and that ordinary people can be driven to troll. Given the previous view of trolling, we might have concluded that simply removing uh, the bad actors would make all our problems go away. But if trolling is instead situational, we need a different perspective and we need a different set of questions uh, to understand what's going on and what we can do about it. So here are three questions that I'm going to try to answer in this talk. So first, we're going to look at why trolling occurs or the causes of any social behavior and how anyone might become a troll. Next. We'll look at uh, how antisocial behavior might worsen over time and even spread from one person to another. And last, we'll take a bird's eye view of antisocial behavior and spreading behavior more generally and look at cascades and if it can be predicted. So how this is done is through com complementing data mining with crowdsourcing. You can use data mining to find generalizable insights and then combine this with the use of crowdsourcing, which enables online experimentation that can then establish causal links. And more broadly, this work really seeks to identify the principles of human behavior and the large social systems that we use today, which you can then draw on to design uh, better ones. And to do this, we use data mining, machine learning, study large amounts of data, and make predictions, network science, to understand the structure of these online interactions, and then HCI, human-computer interaction, to design, with, design, experiment with, and build these social platforms. So that was the big picture. And now let's dive in and start with the causes of antisocial behavior and ask if anyone can become a troll. So before I continue, as a heads up, some of the examples of antisocial behavior in this talk may contain strong and offensive language. So in this work, we study antisocial behavior in the context of public commenting platforms, such as on CNN. So here's an article on CNN from a few years back. It talks about how women uh, perceive themselves online. And here are some of the actual comments on this article. So here's one pretty insensitive comment. I'm not going to read them out. And if that wasn't good enough for you, here are the replies to that comment. Right? So there's some name calling. There's some sarcasm. And then it's mostly not very constructive. 
So understand these instances of antisocial behavior like what I just showed you. In collaboration with Discuss, we analyzed the data set consisting of multiple large commenting communities. The data set we analyzed comprised over a terabyte of complete data, over a year of activity from 76 million users who made a total of 470 million posts and 831 million votes. But before we can analyze trolling, we need a working definition of what trolling is. So here are four different definitions of trolling. Is it engaging in negatively marked online behavior? Is it not following the rules? Is it taking pleasure in upsetting others? Or is it disrupting a group while staying undercover? And a lot of these definitions make sense in different contexts, right? Some are broader, some are narrower, more specific. Some encode intent, and some do not. And maybe your preconceptions of what a troll is and your experiences may speak to even other definitions. And in this work, what we are actually interested in lies closer to bad behavior in general. And so we take inspiration from some of these broader definitions and define trolling as behavior that occurs outside of community norms. And so under this definition, regardless of intent, trolling happens as long as people are seen to behave like trolls. And why this is nice is that the community guidelines uh, for many websites are pretty similar. No name calling, no personal attacks, uh, no offensive material, and so on. And by looking at how moderators moderate these communities using these guidelines, can they use this as signals to automatically identify instances of trolling? So while these trolls exist, again, we don't really know very much about who's responsible for this bad behavior. And as prior work, as well as these headlines above suggest, the media portrays trolls as this group of misfits that are definitely not any of us in this room right now, I hope. Uh, but is this really the case? What can looking at our data tell us? So for instance, if trolling is innate, are trolls just trolling more often than not? So here's a plot showing the distribution of users who are banned from CNN.com, which we use as a proxy for trolling. And we might imagine that if these trolls are inherently bad, that they have most, if not all, of their posts deleted by moderators. But while many of these supposed trolls have all their posts deleted, that the sizable number also have a much smaller proportion of posts deleted as well. In other words, distribution of trolls or people who are banned is bimodal. And so could these two peaks correspond to two different types of antisocial behavior that goes on? So maybe the people who are writing bad things all the time are these lifelong regular trolls, while those uh, who only have a smaller fraction of their posts to it, maybe they're just having a bad day, right? And importantly, because we're looking at banned users only, this is going to underestimate the population of situational trolling. And so because of this observation, now we start to reconsider our assumptions that maybe trolls are not just a vocal minority. So rather than trolling being mostly innate, what if any social behavior was actually a lot more situational. And, but again, how are we going to go about showing whether this is true or not, right? We can make observations with data, but it's hard to demonstrate exactly what causes trolling. And if we did run an experiment, the same thing might, might, it might, we might uh, encounter a different issue, that it won't generalize. So what we did was to combine both, right? To conduct an online experiment simulating a discussion, as well as carry on an observational study of an actual discussion community. And so while the experiment helps us establish causality, our data analysis lets us demonstrate that these findings can be replicated and that they generalize. So now I'm going to claim that any, anyone can become a troll. And using, using evidence from experiments and data, I'm going to show you how it's possible to induce people to troll. And first, I'm going to do so by drawing on theories from social psychology, the first of which is the broken windows theory. And this theory suggests that norms can strongly signal whether further bad behavior happens. For instance, that broken windows signal that crime was acceptable in the neighborhood. The second theory concerns how unpleasant stimuli or aversives uh, increase aggression. So one study showed how exposure to secondhand smoke increased a person's aggression towards unrelated others. And so, again, a lot of this prior work uh, was conducted several decades ago in the absence of online interactions and under different circumstances. So could this actually translate to trolling online? So to begin, we first conduct an experiment on Mechanical Turk that simulated a discussion forum. And the general structure of the experiment was as follows. So we had participants take a quiz, and then had them participate in an online discussion. And so while varying the study conditions, we then ran many identical discussions in parallel to observe how participants' behavior changed. In this experiment, we used a two by two between subjects factorial design, and we modified the difficulty of the quiz, and as well as the initial discussion context. 
So drawing on theories of aggression, we vary the difficulty of the quiz to influence participants' mood. And drawing on the broken windows theory, we vary whether discussion context was good or bad. So what did this quiz look like? So the quiz that we asked participants to do looked like this, and it had 15 questions. I'm showing you a small part of that. The version of the positive mood condition, like you see here, was calibrated to be pretty easy, so that participants with high scores and maybe feel good about themselves. The other version of the quiz uh, was substantially more difficult and designed so that most participants would score poorly. And in this version, we told participants that they did poorly on the test anyway, regardless of how they were actually performing. <laughs> and last, uh, these participants also had five minutes to answer all 15 questions. So good luck with that. <laughs> so after completing this test, we then had participants take part in a discussion about the then upcoming US uh, presidential elections. So for some, for some context, this experiment was done during the 2016 Democratic primaries, where people are deciding whether to choose Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders as the Democratic Party's presidential candidate. So in the positive discussion context condition, we see that these discussions were initially more positive, more, oh, sorry, not more neutral and constructive comments such as these. And in negative discussion condition, these C comments were more negative. And I did not make any of these comments up. So what happened? So first, as a manipulation check for mood, using a post-quiz validated mood questionnaire, we found that people were in a much worse mood after the hard quiz than the easy quiz. People also got much worse scores in the hard quiz as well. And second, as a check for discussion context, we also found that the initial seat posts in the negative discussion context condition were perceived worse as well. They were only 36% upvoted compared to those in the positive context condition, where, which were 90% upvoted. So now onto our main result. So how much trolling was there in each condition? So here we had two expert raters label posts as trolling or not, blind to condition, using standard community guidelines, such as from CNN.com. And we then measured what proportion of posts made in each condition were troll posts. So if participants were in the positive mood and context condition, or that they saw the easy quiz or discussion uh, without any initial trolling, the rate of trolling was lowest at 35%. And so this number might already look a bit high, but also remember that participants were commenting on a relatively controversial topic at the time. So if people got the difficult quiz or were shown troll posts previously, the rate of trolling increases in both cases by a similar amount. And if people got both the difficult quiz and were shown troll posts, this led to almost twice the incidence of trolling. We tested the significance of these results using a mixed effects logistic regression model and find that both main effects are significant and that there are no significant interaction effects. Analyzing our data a different way, we can use Luke as well to measure the proportion of negative emotion words as a proxy for trolling behavior. And we find similar trends here. Well, the proportion of negative emotion words almost tripling in the worst condition as compared to the base positive condition. And to give you a sense of what participants actually wrote, here are two examples. So here's one comment from the good condition. So when participants did the easy quiz and were shown neutral comments like this, majority of them are pretty reasonable. On the other hand, when people were in a bad mood and or had seen prior troll posts, they wrote things like this. So in other words, bad mood and negative discussion context increase trolling. But you might also not ask or maybe say that this is just a lab experiment, right? And these results may not hold up in the real world. So we also analyzed an actual discussion community, CNN.com, to see if we could try to replicate these findings. So turning to data, here's what we found in relation to both mood and discussion context. So now while we can't study mood directly, we can study its correlates. So for example, prior work measured how mood tends to swing the time of day and day of week, and found remarkably stable patterns in how negative affect or the amount of negative words used on Twitter changes with time. So if we can observe similar trends uh, with regards to indicators of trolling, that would be highly suggestive of mood also influencing trolling. So here's a plot of the time of day on the x-axis and the proportion of flag posts on the y-axis. And what we find here is that the post made in the morning is much less likely to be flagged for abuse than one made in the evening. Right? And what's nice about this is that this matches Golders and Macy's findings about how negative affect changes with the time of day. Similarly, there are also changes uh, based on the work week. 
So post flagging or trolling is highest at the beginning of the work week on Mondays and decreases as we near the weekend, like today or tomorrow. <laughs> And we didn't just observe this for the proportion of flag posts. So across multiple indicators of trolling, trolling increases at the times of day and days of week where people are in worse moods. We also find that anger can lead to more anger. So just as we found that doing poorly on the quiz affected later commenting in the discussion, negative mood spills over from prior discussions into subsequent unrelated ones. So to show this, we looked at a discussion uh, with at least one flag post and selected a user who was flagged and a user who wasn't at random. And so that we weren't selecting people who are already trolls, we ensured that both users never had any of their prior posts flagged or deleted. Now, when each user goes on to post in a separate discussion, we then compare the likelihood of that future post being flagged as well. And what we find is that the user who was previously flagged was also more likely to be flagged in a later discussion. So in other words, if we compare users who trolled in a previous discussion with those who did not, those that who did troll were twice as likely to troll in this later unrelated discussion. So that was moot. Now turning to discussion context, we can also directly replicate our experimental findings here and show that the initial post of a discussion strongly affects the subsequent likelihood of trolling. So here, we compare two top-level discussions in the same article where one begins with a flag post and one does not. We find that discussions that do begin with a flag post are more likely to have subsequent post flag as well. And here again, to control for confound, we exclude the OP as well as users flagged or deleted in the past. And in fact here, an initial troll post increases the rate of trolling in subsequent posts by 63%. So that was context. So having established factors relating to trolling experiments and in data, as a next step, can we predict trolling or if a particular post will, uh, will be a troll post before it happens? Right? So here we examine a balanced data set of about 120,000 posts, where random guessing results in 50% accuracy. We then train a logistic regression classifier on the following sets of features. Mood, discussion context, and user features. So you can measure mood indirectly through flagging in discussions, along with diurnal changes. And we can measure context by looking at the prior posts in the same discussion. So the third is basically an indicator variable uh, for every user. And these features let us test the relative importance of two hypotheses about whether trolling is situational or if trolling is innate. And so here is what we found. So if we just, we can identify trolling behavior by finding these supposed trolls. We do kind of okay, right? Getting about 0.66 AUC. But when looking at mood and context, we can do a little better. Now, mood alone does do worse, but this is expected since we can never observe mood directly. But however, discussion's context does outperform using user-specific features and showing here that extrinsic factors such as discussion's context are more important than these intrinsic user-specific features in predicting trolling. And of course, if we combine both types of features, we can do even better at predicting if a subsequent post will be a troll post. And notably, we can do this without looking at the content of the post in question. So to summarize uh, this first part, we might think about two factors that influence a user to troll. So first, their mood sets a baseline for how susceptible they are to trolling. And when a user participates in a discussion, posts written by other users uh, tend to provide the spark or impetus to the user and directly results in them trolling or not. And so to end this section, because trolling is more situational than innate, that ordinary people can become a troll under the right or wrong circumstances. So but now we might be also thinking, like, what could we do to mitigate bad behavior? So could voting be the answer to all problems? So voting is present in a lot of many social media websites, with one popular example being Reddit. And the concept behind voting is simple, that better content should get more upvotes, and that worse content should get more downvotes. But does this actually work in practice? So here's a different claim. So instead of voting helping to reduce bad behavior, we claim that it instead exacerbates the problem because downvoting can cause negative behavior to worsen. And so this is the next question that we're going to ask, right? How any social behavior might worsen over time? And in other words, could antisocial behavior spiral? So in this section, we're going to look at the role voting has and how people get from bad to worse. And as votes are essentially a way for users to evaluate each other's content, we subsequently describe them as evaluations. 
So here our goal is to see how people might react not only to negative, but positive evaluations, and so that we can compare the differences. So what do we mean by a positive or negative evaluation? And again, I did not make any of these comments up. So here's an actual comment that got five up votes and four down votes. And together, uh, these numbers can help us quantify how positive or negative uh, an evaluation is. So in this work, we define a positively evaluated post as one where the proportion of upvotes is greater than some given threshold, say the 75th percentile posts, in terms of this proportion of upvotes. And similarly, a negatively evaluated post is one where the proportion of upvotes is lower than some given threshold, say the 25th percentile. So given that the user received a positive or negative evaluation from other members of the community, how will that user's behavior change afterwards? So theory suggests that either could be possible, right? Operant conditioning says that feedback would guide authors towards better behavior, so that users would behave better after getting either a positive or negative evaluation. So an upvote means that you did well, and a downvote means that you didn't and should improve in the future. On the other hand, bad is stronger than good. Bad impressions are quicker to form and more resistant to disconfirmation. And as people have a much better memory for when bad things happen than when good things happen, maybe this could be the effect instead. So which of these is actually the stronger effect of the two? So to answer this question, we focus on four large commenting communities, some of which you might uh, <coughs> recognize. And the results I'll show here apply to all of them. So say we have two users, one positively evaluated and one negatively evaluated. If we look at these users posting histories, one important question we want to ask is how either user's posts are evaluated before or after the middle positive or negative evaluation. But of course, simply comparing different users isn't going to work, because who's to say that users who get downvoted are inherently worse commenters? And similarly, a downvoted comment might also be an inherently worse comment. So how might we solve this? So what I do here instead is conduct an observational study using what's called propensity score matching. The general idea here is that we want to match pairs of users so that they are as similar as possible up to the point of comparison, and then see what happens when they receive different treatments, in our case, a positive or negative evaluation. And here we put our findings using PSM, but using CEM, CEM or course and exact matching, also produces similar findings. So here again, here are two users, one positively evaluated and one negatively evaluated. And of course, these two users are not going to be writing the same thing, but we want to ensure that they are. So what we do is first match pairs of users on text quality, which essentially turns text into a comparable number. But of course, what on earth is text quality? So here's how we compute it. So what we did here was train a machine learning classifier that only uses bigram text features of a post content to learn the proportion of upvotes P that it received. And we then defined the predicted proportion of upvotes uh, as text quality Q of a post. Right? And we obtain Q just by looking at the text of each of these posts. You might be concerned with bias uh, in computing text quality since the proportion of upvotes is itself biased, but hopefully you're already doing pretty well here by only using text as our features. And as an initial check, what we did here was we crowdsourced labels of whether a post was good or bad, again using these standard community guidelines for a subset of posts where 10 crowd workers evaluated each post. And from this, we can obtain Q prime or a true label of text quality. And now to see how good Q is compared to P, we can then correlate Q prime with both P and Q. And here's what we found. So you find that text quality is far more correlated with the crowd's guess uh, than the actual proportion of upvotes is. And what this is saying is that text quality Q is a reasonable, but nonetheless noisy approximation of Q prime. We can also observe that the error between Q and Q prime is distributed relatively randomly for different values of Q, so that there's no systemic bias in using Q to estimate Q prime. So but back to the problem. So to match pairs of users, we first ensure that these two posts have similar text quality. We also control for the length of the post and the number of words. Right? And we further make sure that these users complete posting histories were similar before this positive or negative evaluation. For example, ensuring that they have a similar number of posts and a similar proportion of upvotes on their posts in the past. After controlling for these factors, we now have match two users that are indistinguishable on our match covariates, only that one user got a positive evaluation, but the other got a negative evaluation. 
So after controlling for these covariates, how then should we measure how these subsequent posts are evaluated? So to answer this question, we also need to understand what an evaluation is. So essentially, there are two components to an evaluation. We evaluate something that someone wrote, both the something, the content, and the someone, your preconceptions of that person. Both affect these evaluations that you give. So on one hand, there are these textual effects, or text quality, or how well people write. So in other words, was the post downloaded because it was badly written? The other part of this are the community effects, or how the community perceives that particular user. So does a person get downvoted regardless of what they post because the community simply dislikes them? So to start, let's look at the first component of these evaluations relating to the text of a post and ask if people write better or worse after a positive or negative evaluation, having controlled for a covariance such as text quality prior. So what we find here is that using a Wilcoxon sign rank test, we find that post quality drops significantly after negative evaluation but not after a positive one. And this is true in all of the communities that we studied. Right? So this change after a negative evaluation echoes findings on the positive-negative asymmetry effect from social psychology. The intuition here is that you feel a lot worse after getting a negative evaluation than after you get a positive one. So people write worse after receiving a negative evaluation. So let's also look at how community perception changes after these positive or negative evaluations. So for example, after receiving a negative evaluation, does community perception worsen? But of course, I haven't also showed you how community bias is computed. So for each post in our data set, we have the number of upvotes, number of downvotes, as well as text quality all scaled to be between 0 and 1. And comparing the actual evaluations with the predicted text quality, you can then see if the community is positively or negatively biased. So what do we find? What we find here is kind of a halo effect. Posts made after negative evaluation were perceived worse than we'd expect, but not after a positive evaluation. In other words, the community is predisposed to downvote you if you've been downvoted in the past, regardless of what you write. And on CNN, your posts are on average being evaluated over 30 percentage points worse than would be predicted by text quality. So to visualize all of these findings so far, since there are a lot of them, so say we have two posts by two users, one positively evaluated and one negatively evaluated. The y-axis signifying how positive something is. First, we control for the text quality of these two posts. And then next, we also ensure that these two users that wrote these posts have similar posting histories. If we then look at what happens to text quality after the positive or negative evaluation, we find that text quality drops after negative evaluation, but not after a positive one. And if you further compare the changes in community bias or other perceptions of these posts, we find that perception worsens after negative evaluation beyond what text quality indicates. So in summary, here's what happens to negatively evaluated users. So not only do these negatively evaluated users write worse posts after, these posts are perceived worse by the community. And there is more bad news. So you'd hope that maybe negative feedback discourages people from posting. But however, people who are negatively evaluated are also more likely to post more frequently than those who are positively evaluated. And, and to make things even better or worse, depending on your perspective, they're also more likely to evaluate other people's posts more negatively as well. So they retaliate to being downvoted by downvoting others as well. So let's update our model of trolling. So mood as well as context uh, through what other people write can cause people to troll. But beyond just writing, downvoting can also make things worse. Bad behavior can feed back into the system. As people get trolled or downvoted, are more likely to troll and downvote others, uh, resulting in a negative spiral. So what this really means is that a, a troll might just have been an ordinary user that got downvoted, started to write worse, and be perceived worse, and then they never really recovered after that. So given that antisocial behavior can spread from person to person on a macro level, can we actually observe this downward spiral in these communities? And maybe we can. So here's some food for thought and a slide about how the proportion of upvotes on CNN.com is changing over time. On the x-axis here is from December 2012 to August 2013. We don't have newer data because CNN stopped having comments on this website. Uh, <laughs> and on the x and the y-axis is the proportion of upvotes. So we know that it starts out higher, but it's gradually decreasing over time. 
And if we leave, so what this says is that if we leave negative behavior unchecked in the community, it can have far reaching effects in the long term and cause the community to worsen over time. And definitely here more work needs to be done. But overall, it's interesting to see how these microscopic interactions between individuals may translate into macroscopic observations. So at this point, I've talked about antisocial behavior and how it might spread from person to person. I haven't talked about what's going on at a macro level, right? So how is bad behavior and bad information spreading in these networks? And is that spread predictable? So popping up one level, in this section, I'm going to uh, explore what happens when bad things cascade. And so one related thing here is that beyond bad behavior, something that's also been getting attention recently is bad content, or more generally, rumors. So rumors don't only come in the form of fake news. So once in a while, you see these image memes make the rounds, and you might wonder why these things keep appearing. Right? And so when studying these kinds of image memes and these rumors, what we notice commonly is that the same rumor can have wildly differing levels of popularity. So here are two examples of uh, different people sharing the exact same thing on Facebook. And why did one get no reshares and one got 416? And also what's worrying here is that the one on the right that got 416 shares was also the one where people called it out as fake. So what is going on? Right? So rather than focusing on the rumor itself, perhaps you can also learn something from understanding the underlying network uh, in which rumors, misinformation, and fake news propagate. And so if we analyze the cascade that makes up the spread of a rumor, we can then ask the broader question of whether these cascades are predictable and where our findings can then be applied to both rumor cascades as well as the spread of other information cascades. So for some background as to what a cascade is, here's a friendship network with edges connecting friends. And suppose that I share a rumor, and maybe two of my friends decide to share a rumor as well. Two more people see this rumor shared by my friends and share it with their friends. And as more and more people share this rumor, a cascade is formed, highlighted here in gray. So but though we want to predict how a cascade grows, there is evidence that cascades may be inherently unpredictable. And there are several compelling reasons why this might be. So the first is that large cascades are rare. So shown here is the distribution of the size of reshare cascades on Facebook. And as you can see here, the number of cascades that grows large is vanishingly small. So less than 10% of cascades reach 100 or more reshares. And because these large cascades are so rare, it might be hard to predict when they occur, if they do at all. And past research also provides more evidence. So in the famous music lab experiment, participants use a music ranking service to rate songs. And the goal was to see which songs would become popular when the experiment was repeated many times. And what the study found was that it was hard to predict which songs would get popular in each instance of the experiment. So in other words, that increasing the strength of social influence increased both inequality and unpredictability of success. So this suggests that it might be difficult, if not hopeless, to predict if something will become popular or if a cascade will grow large. Another thing that makes cascades unpredictable is that they can die down and then resurface or recur after a long period of time. So in contrast to prior work and perhaps our intuitions, what I want to show here today is that cascades are actually predictable. Not only can we predict the cascade's future size, we can predict how its structure will change, how identical pieces of content will be differentiated, and we can also predict if they will come back from the dead. So let's begin with the task of formulating the prediction problem of predicting the growth of a cascade. So given that we have seen some number of reshares, how should we predict its future growth? So there are several possibilities here. Maybe you could ask if a cascade will get a large number of reshares. Maybe you could use regression to predict how large a small cascade will get. Or perhaps you can also only look at the largest cascades. And each of these have different problems. There are issues in terms of the size of each class the distribution of data, and how data was selected. How may instead form a prediction task that doesn't suffer from these issues? So what if we instead ask if a cascade will reach the median size? By definition, the median splits the data set 50-50. So we have a balanced classification task. Now you might ask, what is this median f of k? So perhaps more intuitively, the question of whether a cascade will reach the median size is equivalently a question of whether it will double. And this follows because the size of a cascade tends to follow a power law distribution with exponent 2. So to formally, de uh, formally describe this cascade growth prediction problem, we ask, given that a cascade has obtained k reshares, will it double in size? 
And what's good about this approach is that it results in a balanced prediction task and also allows us to track growth over time by varying k. So here the study cascading behavior. We sampled over 70 million public photos uploaded to Facebook, result in 5 billion reshares, and tracked reshares of these photos for 28 days following the initial upload. And so we looked at four different sets of features. Content features, like whether it had overlaid text or not, whether it looked like a meme. User features, such as friend count and gender. We looked at structural features, like proximity to the root node or out degree, because these cascades are basically directed acyclic graphs, so we can tend to study them that way. And temporal features, or how quickly uh, these reshares are propagating uh, on the graph. So what we find here is that we can predict cascade growth reasonably well using a logistic regression classifier to predict if a cascade that reached five reshares will double in size, we find that performance is robust, independent of feature sets. So even without temporal features, which do the best on their own, we don't lose too much in accuracy. So cascade growth is predictable, at least for five reshares. But what if the number of reshares we observe increases? What happens to predictability as we observe more of a cascade? So how does prediction performance change with k as the number of reshares increases? So is it easier or more difficult to predict whether a cascade of 5 reshares will grow beyond 10 reshares, or a cascade of 10 reshares will grow beyond 20 reshares? So on one hand, maybe you have more data in the second task, so the second one is easier. But at the same time, the second is a harder, more complex question, and that you have to predict further into the future. So which is it? What we find is that as a cascade grows larger, it becomes easier to predict if it will double. And these results demonstrate that observing more of a cascade while predicting further into the future is easier than observing, observing a cascade early in its life and predicting what you'll do next. And again, what's nice about this approach is that it allows us to continue to ask as a cascade grows in size from small to large, whether it's going to continue doubling. But not only is cascade growth predictable, for instance, we can also predict if a cascade will be structurally more or less viral. And we can also predict if a cascade will recur or come back. So if this was the individual view of any social behavior from before, this might be uh, the, how the network view looks like, where posts, comments, views, and rumors are transmitted, are transmitted from person to person, but also result in these long-range, uh, far-reaching cascades in the network. So to conclude uh, this, this part of the talk, here's the overall summary of what we found. So we found that trolling is situational, and that, a per and that a person's mood and context of a discussion can influence them to troll, meaning that ordinary people can end up trolling under the right or wrong circumstances. We found that trolling behavior can spread in the network, not only through these effects, but through <coughs> negative evaluations or downloading as well. Finally, looking more globally and studying cascades uh, of bad behavior and misinformation, we looked at the spread of rumors and of cascades and find that contrary to a prior belief that these cascades are fundamentally unpredictable, that their spread of growth can be predicted. So what, what's next, right? So as I mentioned previously, this plot on how the proportion of upvotes is decreasing over time is very interesting, and one where more research is needed. As, are these observations due to cascades, or are they due to changing populations? Right. More generally, how could we predict the trajectory of a cascade of a community moving forward? Will a community eventually decline, and how long will that take? But overall, given all these results right, on antisocial behavior and this talk about studying the demise of communities, it might be easy to feel kind of cynicism and despair about the state of social media or social computing. But knowing the mechanisms of antisocial behavior, you might also think about building better systems that deal with such behavior, that instead encourage pro-social behavior. One important design implication of our results was that downvoting is relatively toxic in, non in user communities, so you might want to prioritize designs that exclude it. And now, so because we have a better understanding of how context leads to people trolling, here's an example of how a context-aware discussion platform that uses machine learning interventions might encourage uh, pro-social discourse. For example, if we think about a user who might be angry in the heat of the moment, maybe because they recently participated in a heated discussion, you could delay posts for some time. You might also think about how it might introduce mechanisms to mediate conversations. So some recent work showed how bots can be used to sanction badly behaving users on Twitter, as shown in this example. Approaches such as this could help manage flaring tempers, highlight constructive con conversations, and even guide these conversations too. And beyond this, 
I see several other promising directions in the field of antisocial computing. And one is on both broadening and deepening the scope of what antisocial behavior or trolling means. So we talked about antisocial behavior in, the, in here very generally. But there are many distinct types of it, including what's called sock puppetry. Right? In this example here, we see two supposedly different users uh, complementing the writer of an article. But it's subsequently revealed that they are actually the same person. So in a recent paper that I was fortunate to be a part of uh, with Srijan, who is somewhere in this room, uh, yeah, uh, we developed tools to, to characterize and automatically identify uh, sock puppets in online discussions. So more broadly, there are also a lot of opportunities to continue to develop platforms that not only address trolling, but also other difficult challenges such as polarization and misinformation. And at the same time, we don't know very much about how algorithms impact what people see. Understanding what role these play in propagating negative behavior or memes can help better, better quantify what impact ranking has on what we do. And while we looked at how behavior spreads from person to person or how cascades spread on Facebook, it also would be valuable to take an even larger picture approach and track cascades of information or behavior at a larger scale as we continue to evolve over communities over very long periods of time. So while this talk was about antisocial computing, I think the methods here extend beyond understanding bad behavior. What I hope this research demonstrates is that we can develop holistic end-to-end -end approaches for analyzing and building social systems. Right? By combining large-scale analysis with experimentation, we can make generalizable observations that are backed by experiments uh, which establish causality and which enable prediction. For example, like the work on identifying the causes of trolling. This approach also allows us to look at both the big picture interactions in networks and relate them to those between individuals. Right? For example, in relating network theoretic properties of networks, of cascades, to the mechanisms um, through which they propagate. And importantly, it also seeks to leverage uh, these findings to develop new systems that better support our online interactions. So as a whole, this research shows how multi-methods analyses allow us to identify patterns in data, verify hypotheses, uh, hypotheses, make predictions, and develop social systems. And through the work I presented today on so antisocial behavior and on cascading behavior, I hope that I've shown how this can be done in practice. Now, we're almost at the end, but I'd like to take some time to thank everyone who's helped me in one way or another. I think this is probably the only time I can do this publicly, so I want to do it now. So to begin, I'd like to thank, thank Yuri, perpetually full of ideas and energy, who's helped me continuously push my boundaries and that of others. Michael, always positive and supportive, who has encouraged me uh, to explore so much interesting work that I unfortunately cannot cover in this talk. John, to whom I owe my interest in social network analyses. Lada, one of my role models, and without whom many of these projects wouldn't exist. And of course, James and Jeff, thank you for agreeing to be part of my orals committee. Christian, who I've worked with since I was an undergrad, and Dan, who sparked my interest in human-centered research. Thank you to each and every one of my collaborators. Uh, research would not have been done without you. And thank you to all the people who I met in grad school and made life a little bit more colorful. And to my family as well. I wouldn't be standing here without them. And finally, to everyone in the Stanford HCI group and the SNAP group, Stanford VPGE, Microsoft Research, Facebook, Pinterest, Discuss, for having supported and continuing to support my research. And thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions now. Yeah, that was really cool. Thanks. So, uh, other question. Um, you you talked a lot about the negative problems with social discussions, like all this flaming and so on. Is there any positive side to it? Like, do people get anything out of online comments? Do you see people changing their minds or feeling happier? Or should we just like get rid of all these discussions? And... I think I think the the approach to getting rid of all discussion platforms is one that works, but it's also a bit short sighted. I think one good example of this is there is a subreddit on Reddit called uh, "Our Change My View." And that was a really good paper out of Cornell uh, that looked at that community and how people actually uh, work to actually try to change their minds right, in the right settings. Right? There are lots of different platforms, discussion platforms, where discussions don't end up uh, in, in flames. Right? There are lots of smaller places. I think you can imagine like, there are discussions where 
you imagine these things to happen, and there are a lot of smaller ones, right, as well, where discussion is actually a lot more positive, right? So I think discussions in general are good because it's good to talk to people and learn more about the world and about different perspectives. But at the same time, we need the right interventions to kind of make this happen. And so without these interactions, these interventions, these kinds of, uh, I guess, having discussions might actually make things a bit worse, uh, depending as well. So really, I think it depends a lot on like system designers. And it's up to system designers to kind of figure out like what what uh, discussion platforms, what discussion mechanisms work for them, and also up to us to try to really remember that we are talking to other human beings online as well. Yeah. So that interaction of like uh, getting downvoted causes me to go out and troll more. I wonder, I'm wondering how that occurs from the perspective of the troller, right? Because the social <coughs> platforms don't actually send you a notification or something when you get downvoted, right? So isn't it like in conjunction with another comment or some other event that's causing them to come back and see that they've been downvoted? Right. So I think there are, there are kind of a, a few components to this, right? One is definitely the fact that discussion platforms don't actually notify people if they've been downvoted. The only way you know is by going back to your comment and seeing how, how the how the upvotes and downvotes change. And I think maybe some of us have experienced this on Reddit as well, where we go make a comment and then we keep refreshing the page to see if people have upvoted or downvoted us and seeing how our score changes over time. And I think maybe this might be one part of what happens, right? That when you see this happen, maybe you start to think like, oh, this this community is like terrible, right? I I don't I don't agree with what they're doing here. I, I I wrote such a good comment and then people are just like attacking me and downloading me. Who are these who are these ridiculous people, right? I'm going to stop caring about uh, what I write and I'm going to just start writing worse. And that might be a reason why people start to care less about what they write after getting downloaded, right? Because it really feels bad, right? Even if you tell yourself you should not take it personally, you still do. Uh, another part of it is definitely like the different conversations that people take part in. So again, like you see downvoting, you might be involved in a heated discussion, right? Where downvoting does take place. And so this might also be another factor that influences you to, work, to write worse in the future, right? When you just get into a heated discussion and then you just write worse and worse as you start to argue with uh, people, other people in the same thread. Of course, again, we see these effects uh, propagate across uh, different discussions, different threads. So again, this is not all of what's happening. Yeah. Yes? So some of the future work we talked about uh, it discusses how we might prevent these downward spirals from the beginning. But have you also looked into or interested in looking into uh, how we can reverse the downward spirals once they begin? Like can you turn a non can you turn a troll back to a normal human? <laughs> I think I think really that is that is one interesting thing that we have not looked at uh, so far, and that I didn't. I was thinking about putting into future work, but I didn't. Uh, or maybe I should have. Uh, so there's actually a small proportion of users, right? If I remember correctly, it's like about ten percent of users who start out like. Uh, behaving badly in these communities, right? Where all their posts get deleted by moderators. But then after a while, they actually start to get better, right? So I think this is one, one, uh, one part of the data that we can look at to try to better understand, like, how do we stop people from behaving badly over time? So I think that's one approach that we can take. And definitely, I think the, the goal of all this research is not to give people the tools to destroy uh, conversations, but instead to figure out here are the things that make things bad, and here's how we can prevent them or do the reverse. Yeah. Yes? Do you think the same things you observed about negative dynamics, negative comments like that might be positive, true about positive comments as well, like hype? Uh, do we sometimes become ungroundedly excited and fanatic about things that really shouldn't deserve that much support and uh, is the dynamic similar? Hmm. I think that's actually a very interesting interesting point of view about the, the, uh, the effects of hype. I think right now I think the challenge is that it's hard to kind of quantify when hype happens, but I think that's actually a very interesting uh, uh, direction for future work. We did, on the other hand, look at positive comments and seeing whether upvoting can kind of like encourage more upvoting. And the answer is that no, it does not. But maybe hype is different. And I imagine maybe the mechanisms there is different. Like if you're like very excited, personally excited about something, if you see the text and see some people getting excited, I think they're looking at the language of what people write, trying to identify when things happen, when emotions are changing very rapidly from like maybe neutral to very positive. I think that's actually a very interesting uh, approach, uh, direction for future work. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, is there any look into the fact that most users are anonymous? And what does anonymity do to one's 
uh, willingness to be you know, socially disruptive uh, yeah. as opposed to you know, not socially disruptive and not being anonymous. Have yeah, so I think that anonymity definitely has an effect on uh, how people choose to behave because when you're anonymous, you're more disinhibited, right? So you feel there are less consequences for your actions, as you mentioned. But at the same time, I think also that this, this can help. Anonymity, anonymity, not having anonymity is good, right? If you like compare like how much trolling there is on like platforms with or without it. But also think that on Facebook as well, if you look at the public discussions there, that they're not the, the best things you want to read anyway. And those people are using their real names, and you can see if their photos there as well, and they still decide to post these, these comments, right? And so I think that, that may solve some of, the, some of it, but not all of it. And on the other hand, I think an anonymity is really valuable to have in many uh, discussion platforms, especially when you're talking about things where you don't want to reveal your uh, identity to people. So I think that maybe solves the problem to some extent for some groups of people and in some cases. Maybe public comments should always be, uh, uh, be non-anonymous uh, to use your real names there. But there are definitely cases where it's important to be anonymous, to have a separate identity, right? Just to for your own safety. Yeah. Yeah. So in looking at in studying the antisocial behavior, we looked at individual websites. Do you think that uh, the finding generalized to the society as a whole? Okay, kind of a union of everything. <laughs> So I think I think I don't want to go as far as making the claim that it applies to everyone. I think I think these are this is strong evidence that that might be the case that we looked at many different communities and tried and replicated these findings across many of them. Again, a lot of these are news communities, and we tried to also bolster this by using experiments on Mechanical Turk. Again, like each of these methods by themselves have limitations, right? In the populations that you're studying, in the specific intervention that you're testing, right? And in the observations that you're making. But I think like altogether, uh, I think this tries to at least get closer to being able to argue that this does happen at large scale and that it generally applies to most people, not everyone, but in general, in aggregate, to most people. You know. Really thinking of polarization in society nowadays. Yeah, um, yeah, I think if anyone is interested in polarization, I think that is a really interesting and very, very challenging uh, problem to study just because we, I think, yeah, it's just a very hard problem and very difficult to change people's minds. I think probably even more valuable today than ever before. So, yeah, happy to talk about that afterwards too. Yeah. Um, I really like the experiment you done on turning people into trolls. I'm wondering if you have already, or if it would be possible to do, and apologies if I missed this, uh, run a similar experiment where you downvote people and see if that, like you experimentally downvote people either on M or in the wild, and you look at the code. Because I'm just, I'm a little unconvinced by, by those results. Like maybe those people are different to begin with. So could Right, I think I think definitely that that is in the works right now. We are also working on a, a paper where we try to look at what happens when communities uh, when W is introduced in the community. So there we have a natural experiment where you can uh, identify the effects of downvoting. So yes, good point. I think yeah, the, I mean there are lots of limitations to a lot of the work that are presented here. We tried our best to do, do what we can, but again, like it's there are still going to be limitations, though, as you mentioned, though. So yeah. Yep. So I was a bit surprised by the effect that in the section you did on the score matching about the you, you showed that if someone gets a negative vote, negative evaluation, then not only does the intrinsic quality, the text quality decrease, but then they, there's some sort of community memory that's like this person is not good. I'm gonna dump for them. Is that is that also? I guess it just feels surprising that that would be true on such a large uh, discussion forum like CNN, where presumably you don't remember the names of the other commenters on a CNN article. So do you think it's it's really like the sort of community memory, or is it just that the person gets more pissed off and writes differently in a way that might not be captured by your text quality metric? Mm. So I think definitely though those two things uh, are going to. Uh, Play a role, and I think we can we can uh, exactly tease apart all of these factors. Now, this uh, community perception uh, 
the strength of this measure actually is strongest like within discussions, right? So if you look at what people write subsequently, it's, it's strongest there. If we look across discussions where you might not remember like who's there anymore, I think this effect is weaker, but it still exists and is significant there. So I think it's probably a combination of what you mentioned as well, that maybe text quality is not going to capture uh, as much as we hope that it would, that it is. But in general, we tried our best to kind of validate that measure and show that in general it tries to capture most things but but again like you might miss like these kind of uh, corner cases uh, we're going to we try to kind of show how how people kind of like behave worse in communities and again like show that this increases there decreases less here there's a lot of there's a lot more detail in the paper that I'm glossing over right now and a lot of complication that I've abstracted away in this presentation but happy to talk more about this afterwards. Okay, let's thank Justin.